Well, my name is Gerhard Lakemeyer, and I'm extremely happy to introduce Wolfram Burgard, uh, who will give shortly a talk here on his work. And just let me just say a few words about him. He did his PhD at the University of Bonn in 1991. And he joined the University of Freiburg in 1999, where he's been ever since. And uh, he is the head of the, the Autonomous Intelligent Systems Group. Uh, Wolfram has received many, many, many honors. Uh, he's, he, is a, he is an IEEE fellow, a, a AAAI fellow, a URAI fellow, and also a member of the German Academy of Sciences and many other honors. Uh, well, I should mention he also received the Leibniz Prize in 2009, which is the highest honor of the DFG. And a year later, he got an ERC advanced grant, so that's all wonderful work. And uh, regarding his research, just a few words, he's done groundbreaking work over the years in robot navigation. I've known Wolfram for now over 30 years. It's hard to believe. And followed his career very closely. Uh, he also co-authored a book on probabilistic robotics. And so this gets us already to his talk where he's going to be telling us about the state of the art in robot navigation and and autonomous driving. Wolfram, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gerd, uh, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I would prefer to be in person there. Uh, I think I was in, in Aachen a couple of years ago for something like an inauguration day, or I don't recall exactly, or the Aachen Technology Day, which was a lot of fun, uh, giving a talk over there. And um, today I'm going to talk about uh, probabilistic and deep learning techniques. So it's kind of like the transition that we are in right now. Um, and um, with an open question at the very end. So this talk will present some solutions, but we'll end with a big question. And uh, that with the hope that this stimulates some uh, discussions also between uh, the, the participants here. And I'm really excited to see so many people here. So thanks for coming. Um, second, um, yeah. So. We're going to talk mostly about uh, navigation today. Why? Right? What uh, does it take to actually build robots that can uh, navigate their environments and uh, reliably get from A to B, which is a precondition for many applications, including uh, autonomous driving, but also logistics and, and, and transport. And the key challenges there basically are like highly accurate localization, right? So, how can we actually figure out? Where the vehicle is and this uh, in a reliable fashion and also this question of like I need to put that to the front that usually when you do this then these robots basically need maps for doing this so usually what we do when we do localization with these platforms in industri industrial settings or even self-driving cars they mostly rely on a map for solving this uh, localization task and there the question is definitely like, how can we build robust mapping systems that also can deal with changes in the environment, for example, which is one of the key challenges there. And then the key question is also like, how can we use this to establish long-term autonomy? This is what we basically want to have in industrial settings and with autonomous cars. And one of the, the, the key technologies being used these days is a so-called particle filter for localization. And he has a famous video that uh, comes from like uh, data recorded in Bonn. So it's, it's really pretty old data. And uh, so what you can see here is a robot basically estimating its, we call this absolute position in its environment. Basically it's figuring out where it is given no prior knowledge about its posts. And uh, this environment is particularly challenging, but the idea here is basically to use, uh, due to its symmetries, but the idea is to use a particle filter, which uses a set of hypotheses to actually represent these multimodal distributions coming from the ambiguities and resolve them over time as more sensor data comes in. And this is a technology that uh, is basically the heart of probabilistic robotics, and that is um, basically being used to, for state estimation for these dynamical systems. The key question now is how accurate can we actually get with this? And for this, we did an experiment a few years ago, trying to, to figure out what the accuracy of this technology actually is. And here you can see an industrial uh, robot that uh, 
needs to do or is supposed to do a repetition task where it actually needs to get back to the very same place uh, over and over again. And the black dots and, uh, that you see on the floor are basically or the small stripe is just to indicate uh, to you what the accuracy is. So the robot doesn't have any um, knowledge about these dots. What it basically does is it uses its LiDAR range scanners or la laser range scanners, uh, give me a second, uh, which are mounted over here and over there to basically figure out where it is in the environment and to pos position itself accurately in there. Let me see as to whether um, uh, that is, here we go, laser pointer off, and then we can actually continue this video. And there you can see how it actually, based on the, the LiDAR range data, accurately positions itself. And um, yeah, we also did this on a more like sophisticated version, still a prototype, of a, of a robot that is supposed to transport the fuse latches of the 777 through the Boeing premises in Seattle. And uh, we experimented here with these, with these vehicles. So an 11 ton vehicle that uh, where we basically used these, these wooden frames that you see uh, and that we move away and, and add in different configurations to figure out the sensitivity with respect to noise that, uh, the, and in the perception data of the LiDAR range scanner. And in the bottom, you see plots about the accuracy that you can actually obtain with this technology. You can basically see that uh, in, uh, in static environments, we are within like a two millimeter range or below a two millimeter range when it comes to localization accuracy. Uh, and, um, and then the rotational error lies below 0 0.02 uh, uh, degrees in this case. And um, this is actually sufficient for industrial processes, which um, actually made this technology ready for um, logistics applications and, uh, and, con and construction floors. At the, uh, the key question, and then once you have a technology like this, there are several questions that come up. First of all, like, can we do this also with cheaper sensors? Can we do this with the camera as well? And um, can we also do this when the environment changes even more and substantially and potentially also in a way that the robot needs to take different routes. And this is something that we are going to discuss today, but first focus on, uh, on cheaper sensors. Like how can we do this, for example, with cameras? And this is a paper that uh, like we worked on a few years ago where we tried to do you to use cameras for accurate localization in this a more expensive 3D point cloud data but the, the interesting question here is like, can we actually use a cheap camera and potentially even a cell phone camera to localize the cell phone accurately with respect to a point cloud recorded from, for example, a self-driving car. And um, that what we did at that time was basically using visual odometry to reconstruct a local point cloud and then use iterative closest points uh, with non-linearly squares to basically to calculate the 60 OF camera post. And uh, this is very similar approach to that what we saw before. And here you can see a visualization uh, of this in action where you basically on the bottom right see the camera image and then the, um, the point cloud and the, the, the points re uh, reconstructed from the camera image projected into the point cloud. Uh, and this is a bit on the, uh, for the Kitty data set. We did also experiments with our own data set uh, that we created in, in Freiburg. And um, you, over different uh, times of day and different lighting conditions and different weather conditions and so on. And you can see a visualization of, uh, of this process in, on the Freiburg campus with a smartphone carried by uh, one of my students. And uh, on the left, you basically see, what you see is you see the reprojection of the uh, of the image projected onto the the point cloud, and you might now wonder why these branches of the trees are white. They are bluish. That's because the branches of the trees are not exactly there where they were um, in the map, which means that we sometimes, or in most of the cases, because they are moving, also that we project uh, the sky onto the branches, and this is why they look. Uh, light bluish. Um, yeah, we also applied this to, to self-driving cars where we, are, we implemented something like a valley parking application 
This is a uh, dear Kennel sitting behind the steering wheel, um, joint student of uh, Garrett and me long, many years ago, um, almost 20, uh, was one of the very first people working on robots in Bonn. He's now at Waymo working on self-driving cars. And this is a project that we did um, six years ago, where we basically took the, um, the, the auto autonomous driving stack of the, um, the Stanford autonomous car, built, used the, the map mapping technology that we have in order to enable this vehicle to do GPS-less navigation in, uh, in a parking garage where we basically replace the GPS signals by the localization um, estimates that we got from the LIDARs given the map that the vehicle has. And with that, the vehicle could actually could navigate this, this parking structure and then perform an autonomous parking maneuver on, on the roof. And um, yeah, let's, and then the key question is how you can actually build maps. And uh, one of the te popular techniques in, in, in robotics is using also a particle filter. Yeah, you basically extend that what you do in localization, having an X, Y and, and, and position plus orientation by the map as well. And there's a compact way of, of, of representing this. And from this, you can basically calculate accurate maps. But uh, the alternative to using a particle filter is to phrase this as an optimization problem, in which case you basically minimize an error function and uh, which then allows you to calculate the optimal map given all the uh, sensor data that you perceived. And uh, here's an implementation of this process called sparse uh, post adjustment, where you can see that we can do this like on a robot on the fly. Um, so where you can always see that whenever the robot closes the loop, comes back to a position it was before, then the map is being optimized and adjusted. You can also do this in a batch fashion. And uh, you can also go crazy and initialize everything with zero, zero and a random angle, hoping that uh, the, the, the process is able to unfold uh, the correct map out of it. Right, so, so these are the two processes that are typically being used for when you, when you build a robot or, or a self-driving car. But uh, once you do this, right, so you basically, what people do is they first build a map and then, which is often also augmented by in the context of self-driving cars, by all kinds of data. And we would see this in a, in a few seconds. And after that, they try to localize the robot relative to this map. And, um, and here's how far you can get actually with, uh, with this technology. Let me, what we've seen before has been only 2D. This is a small startup that I founded a few years ago with some of my students called uh, DotScene. And they basically built uh, a technology where you can do indoor outdoor combined mapping where you basically carry a sensor head and uh, go through buildings and then take a drone and fly over these buildings so that you can then build a map that combines indoor and outdoor structures of, uh, of buildings and, and, and other things as well, or even like landscapes and so on. And here is uh, a data set that uh, they uh, collected in, in, in fall last year. Um, and they went to Pisa and uh, took a, a data set or recorded this data set of the Leaning Tower. And uh, once you have all the data at hand, you throw this into the SLAM engine. And what you get out of this are uh, highly accurate 3D models of uh, the corresponding structure being scanned. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool video. And in, in, in a few seconds, you see actually uh, the virtual camera flying underneath the ground where you, can, where you then can see how much the uh, the basement of this tower is actually already leaned uh, according to um, the weight of the tower. In a second, we are almost like flying underneath the earth. And here we go. And there you can see how much the, the basement already is inclined. The, um, we also scanned the, the Freiburg Cathedral with this. This is the most accurate uh, model that uh, is available of the Freiburg Cathedral. Right now, it's an uh, indoor-outdoor model. Um, with the basements and all these uh, relevant aspects. So this is a technology that has been become ripe for uh, the market now. But um, the key problem, as I mentioned, the separation of mapping and 
and localization right, poses a problem, namely in the case where um, you all of a sudden become dependent on not too many changes. And this, when you think about camera-based approaches might be lighting conditions. This is always something that uh, people complain about when they speak about cameras, that the approaches presented are not invariant to, to lighting conditions. Um, and the other ones can also be changes to geometry. And uh, what I'm gonna talk about next is an approach that we built recently about um, camera-based mapping and localization under varying lighting conditions. And um, it's a uh, work uh, done by Tim Kozlitz and Mikhail Kravitz, two of my students. And it's a project that has been carried out to, together with Toyota Motor Europe. Um, so the, just to give you an idea, so imagine you have a room like this that you actually uh, want to operate a camera in or a robot, a camera-based robot in. And uh, depending on how the lighting conditions are, right, that might be extremely challenging. And so what you basically would need to have are, is features this, uh, that are invariant to these lighting conditions. Right? So the question that we came up with, uh, like, is there, a, or that we wanted to answer is like, can we find a representation of this environment that is invariant with respect to these lighting conditions? And can we utilize these, the, this representation to um, accurately localize a camera independent of the current, uh, current uh, lighting conditions? And uh, what we actually used to look at is the, the, the reflectance. That, was, that is what we are, we are actually interested in, in represent, representing there. Right, uh, which is basically the, the radiosity divided by the irradiance. So what we what our approach basically does is we estimate the uh, radiosity and the irradiance, and from that we get the reflectance, which should be mostly invariant with respect to uh, the lighting conditions. And we built an entire pipeline for doing this, like right? sensor acquisition, building a 3D model, radiosity estimation. We also estimate where the light sources are. Then we calculate the irradiance and get out the, the reflectance out of this. And for the geometry reconstruction, we mostly relied on, on OrbSlam and um, like, um, truncated sign distance function, mar marching cubes uh, algorithm, so that you can, in the end, generate a 3D mesh for the, the corresponding scene. And here's a, just a, a visualization of that, uh, of that scene that we reconstructed from the, uh, from the depth. And um, then we, we perform the radiosity uh, estimation with some, some outlier uh, removal. And um, here you can basically see that uh, the result of this and um, so we can basically adjust the sensitivity of the camera artificially in order to, to, uh, to visualize this. And the next step is to calculate the irradiance. Um, and then by dividing the two of them, you basically get um, that what we are in the end uh, interested in. And here's the irradiance of that corresponding scene. And what you can see here is already the, the shadows on the ground, for example, right? Which then by dividing by those, you can actually get them out of the, the representation so that in the end, you do have a representation that doesn't include shadows uh, and which is uh, important. Also the reflectance doesn't contain these shadows that you see in the natural scene. And um, so and when you then change the lighting conditions, right? Then the, the hope would be, or ideally, the reflectance representation stays invariant to this. And you can see the corresponding visualiz visualizations of the reflectance obtained for the very same scene under two uh, drastically different lighting conditions. And here you can also see a numerical uh, evaluation. You can basically see that the reflectance values are uh, more or less um, consistent right, over uh, these, these different, um, different scenes for um, different patches of the environment, so for wall and, and floor in this case. And um, then what we also estimate are the light emitters. So it's basically clusters of um, high intensity. Um, and once we have the lighting emitters, 
we then can also play around with them and selectively switch them on and off artificially, uh, artificially to basically render the scene. And from that, we then automatically get these lighting uh, adaptive maps. So we cannot only like change the, so the idea now is to basically estimate the current lighting conditions and then render the scene according to the lighting conditions based on given we know them, the lights, right? And then you can track the camera within these lighting conditions. The key question is when you render the map is how much, how much you actually have to, how much ray tracing you have to do. And uh, there's also something that we evaluated uh, experimentally. So you can have to do these ray casting operations to basically calculate the true color value of, of every voxel or every patch in the scene. And um, we we'll talk about this in a few seconds. And here you can basically also see the uh, different lighting uh, conditions. So different, the lights switched on and off. It's hard to see because the true lights are occupied by these red patches, but you can see this in the vicinity of these. Um, so, so this is like the first light being switched on and then there are more and more, you can see it's from the walls, for example, when more and more lights are switched on. And, and here is the, the, um, the, the predictability also, the, we can see the sensitivity of the number of uh, re reflections that you need to take into account in order to arrive at, at accurate values there. And usually like with, uh, with K equals 10, yeah, basically relatively um, close to, to, the, to, the, um, to the measured value so that there's usually K equals 10 is absolutely sufficient for the number of ray castings that you need to do or reflections that you need to do. And um, you can see this also for K equals one and the measured quantity. And if you increase the, the reflectance then you can see how much closer we actually get. And with K equals 10, yeah, extremely close to the, the measured to the true image. And uh, yeah, once you do this, you can um, then uh, selectively, once you have this, selectively switch on and off the lights and get the correct uh, lighting for, or the correct rendering for the corresponding scene. And uh, what we now then do is basically while we move the camera around, we switch on and off the lights and then, so this is the, the pipeline here. We take the, the camera image and our lighting adaptable map. We analyze the um, different light settings, figure out what the corresponding light setting would be. And we render the image and then we perform um, the camera, uh, the tracking of the camera image given the rendered image, which should be from the light setting, be more accurate to the actual uh, camera image. And here you can see this process in action. So there is, we can see these rectangles on the bottom, which are the individual um, scenes depending on the lighting con configuration. Right? So for example, like this is um, the, the contribution of lamp two and three. And here you can see the contribution of lamp five. And whenever they are green, that means that the two of them must be on. And when you see a red uh, frame around it, then that means that this corresponding light needs to be off. Obviously, those the, those two lights here, that four and five, they are not bright enough. So this is where most of the errors happen because their contribution is not big enough so that the system more often makes an error with the estimate for those two, two lights, actually. And when the camera moves around, then uh, you can basically also switch the, the lighting conditions and then camera sees that now two, three, four, five were on. Now it's only four and five. And uh, so that you can see that with the camera moving and while the camera is moving around, it can actually figure out what the current corresponding lighting condition there might be. And then obviously when you use this in, in localization, then you should be able to get more accurate. And this is what we also then showed in, uh, in experiments. I think um, I'm not wrong and, uh, and there should be like a quantitative evaluation um, in a few seconds. Well, let me see. Um, so, so that's basically the first one for the cameras. I think I missed the quantitative evaluation, but in this paper, we actually also showed 
that you get more accurate by, by using this type of uh, representation and adjusting the lighting conditions depending um, while the camera is moving around. So if you want to look at the quantitative results, then I'd like to refer you to this paper. But now you could ask this, describe the question like, um, now what you did Wolfram is basically, uh, you estimated the, the lights in the rooms, which is a little, looks a little bit artificial because there's also light coming from the sun. Right? So the sunlight is also might also affect your scene. And the question there is like, how much, how much does it take or what does it take to actually also consider the, uh, the current day of time in order to estimate the sunlight and then you know, use the sunlight also in these lighting adaptable representations to um, have a better camera tracking. Uh, so here you can see typical examples like where you have, a, have seen uh, in the afternoon, I think where the sun shines into the room. And obviously when you think about camera tracking, then uh, what would happen is that the, the camera, if you take hand-tuned features, for example, or zift and surf type of features, then they would actually love to be in these corners or at the edges over here and trying to track the camera according to, to these edges, which makes sense when you do this over a short period of time. But if you think about doing this over an entire day, then it might be complicated because like an hour later, those features might be like 10, 20 centimeters far, far away from the current post, which means that then all of a sudden the, the camera would receive features that are in different places. And maybe uh, from that, would, you would obtain larger uh, localization errors. So. so the key question is like, is there a way to model this as well? And uh, so what we did in this case is we also used the, um, the, the, the time of day and the geolocation to actually know where the, the sunlight would be and then do the um, pre use the pre-computed sky and the ground radiosities to render a normalized radiosity image. And then you also need to estimate the brightness scales from this and then do the very same feature tracking that we saw before based on uh, and, and calculate the, uh, the camera pose. Given the rendered image, plus the live input images. And um, this is an, uh, an, an output that you see here on the left-hand side. Um, you basically see the, the rendered image. On the right-hand side, you see the, um, the reference image. And, uh, and let me see. On the top, you see the actually live image from the camera. And on the bottom, the, the rendered image from the very same camera pose. You can see how this actually changes over and over time and uh, different conditions of the sunlight. Um, and obviously there, when you look carefully at it, in some points, there's also like a substantial amount of features that just comes from, uh, the, uh, from, the, from the sunlight, for example, right now. And in such cases, like if you don't have this representation, you would be enormously off uh, with, a, uh, with the tracking approach relying on any type of feature, mostly any type of features in, in these, uh, given this type of data, right? So what I wanted to show you here is that, that by modeling, like this is an actual like modeling approach where you throw a big machinery at a problem and, and a lot of background knowledge that allows you to actually localize or track a system, a camera over time, like, given the live input data. And all what they, we did here is basically trying to react to the dynamic adaptation, to the dynamic changes in the environment, given that what is, uh, what is going on. But when you think about a real robot in the real world, then, then like, things can go even more wrong. But uh, first of all, to, to recap re recapitulate, right, so these maps, for automated driving and also in robotics are useful for all kinds of tasks. Right? These, that's what is what a typical HD map looks like, where the lanes are, poles for localization, is a projection of LiDAR uh, onto the data, but then you can also use the lane markings for localization. And then some maps are even used for ground removal to better get the vehicles or the relevant objects in the scenes. But then there's also a lot of annotation being done in terms of, for example, in intersections, 
where lanes go and through the intersection, or how long lanes go through the intersection and the data association of traffic lights to individual lanes at the intersection. Right? So maps are extremely useful, but uh, even in such a context, as, as soon as you put a lot of effort onto generating or manually annotating maps that are needed for uh, automated driving, for example, then becomes enormously expensive to maintain them. Right? So whenever you have changes and you cannot automatically deal with these changes as we have seen before, like for example, in the context of constructions or construction zones, then things become enormously expensive. And uh, so that what, what we are having here is on one hand, like you can throw a big machinery at this problem of dealing with dynamics, but at some point in particular, when you start doing manual annotations and creating maps manually to facilitate driving, then this, these, these maps really become a problem and, an, and, and a reason for preventing us from building self-driving cars. So the, these type of HD maps are expensive to, to acquire um, and make a lot of assumptions about the availability of these features, um, like for example, like lane markings, and they, they require some form of change detection. And basically because they are so expensive and because of all of these problems, they are, tend to be a barrier towards level five automation, meaning autonomous driving all over the world. And on the top, you see a video that um, my colleague Ryan Justus recorded a few years ago in Ann Arbor. Like if you imagine you're a self-driving car relying on lane markings and encounter a situation like this over here, then obviously like there's no feature left that you could use for um, for localization, right? which, which poses an enormous problem for, um, for self-driving cars. And in the bottom, you see a visualization of a very, very small change uh, done in an environment uh, where the, the Waymo car then actually encounters problems. This is just a few uh, cones put on the, on the, on the, on the lanes, on lane markings between two lanes in order to indicate a construction zone what you can see is that the Waymo car actually pl plans a path through the cones and being unable to navigate around that. And this is, this is a substantial problem. The, the, these maps help us a lot, but as soon as things change, cars and vehicles and robots can become enormously brittle in, with respect to the reaction of, to that. So the key question is, like, also one solution towards this, or step number one would be, Okay, then let's try to figure out as to whether something has changed. And this is um, something that we have been working on as well with um, colleagues from, from BMW. This is David Pan, who recently graduated also from uh, my lab. And um, so the, the idea there is to basically use, instead of like expensive mapping vehicles, like those who are in, in, in driving over and over through the world, and in, in order to figure out that something has changed, to rather use um, like the, the fleet that the OEMs or the car manufacturers typically have. So basically use cheap sensors that all the vehicles have in order to detect changes in the environment that are, for example, due to construction environments. And um, in order to show you how that could work, um, or that this could work first, right? This is like a visualization of the places BMWs have been to in Europe on the right-hand side and in the US on one day. Uh, so you basically can see that the sheer amount of, of, of vehicles, fleet data, for example, might be um, usable for doing some form of change detection and figuring out as to whether something has changed in the world. And here's a, a visualization of uh, Let's see, oh, the, the feature that, that we used in this case and for realizing the approach for detecting changes is uh, vehicle positions, odometry, GPS and markings and lane markings and road edge observations. And from the HD maps, we only use the lane markings and the road edges, not taking into account color, by the way. Um, so here you can see an example where um, the, the vehicle on the fly estimates all these, um, these features that we use for the the post for the for the change detection in the HD maps. 
And um, in general, what the approach does is it uses a particle filter similar to that what we have seen in the very beginning, and then uh, looks basically given these features um, at the innovation. And that this innovation is the likelihood of these observations. And in order to have a be more robust and not to manually tune all these parameters, we used a boosting approach for the classification tasks. And uh, we subdivided the road into, into areas or regions along the, the, the direction of the road. And then for every of these segments that we have, we basically estimate as to whether this the, the classifier says that, that there's a change or not. And in fact, can contradict, like it's, or sometimes it contradicts it, itself. And that what we then basically do is we learn a threshold and take like, like or count these, these votes in, in bins and then have some voting mechanism there to actually figure out as to whether that votes for more for change rather than for no change. And uh, you can see a visualization of these uh, bins along the aerial image of a road uh, that the vehicle actually moved through. And in the beginning, the vehicle is actually completely fine with it, mostly green, simply because it cannot be, be, tell the difference between the yellow and the, the white uh, lane markings. Right? So, and, and only as soon as there's actually a deviation of the, the lanes from the HD map, then the system realizes that most perceptions do not correspond to the actually stored HD map. And in this way, we can track or identify changes uh, and then figure out that there is an, there's an, um, an area which potentially has to be remapped in order for autonomous cars to, uh, to drive around. Here's a visualization for how these um, like this fleet data actually helps. And the more you get to the upper left-hand corner, you, the, the better the individual or the, the usage of the fleet data is compared to just a single uh, drive-through. And um, that brings me to a, to a question. Like, if you think about this problem overall, so ideally, what you would like to have is like the same performance that you get from fleet data from an individual vehicle already. Right? And now imagine that we are able to basically do this. We drive through an environment and immediately with one, like basically one shot decision, tell he, the environment has changed here. And not only saying that it needs to be remapped. So in the ideal case, so in the ideal world, this vehicle would directly report the direct, the correct map. Right? So which would mean that we are basically able to calculate maps like just on the fly. And then this question arises, <clears throat> do we actually need maps? Give me a second. And if you want to do this, then um, you need to answer like a couple of questions. I can, so do, what does it take? Like, it is not only SLAM. We need basically more in order to being able to, to drive robustly. So it's not only about geometry. What we actually need is we need semantics. We need capabilities like data association, tracking um, objects. Uh, the hard problem is traffic light associations, like which traffic light belongs to which lane, which is a relevant traffic light for me. And uh, like what is the road st structure and what is the intersection topology, for example. And this is where basically now deep learning com comes into the game where we are interested in, in, in trying to replace tasks that we have been doing with, with standard probabilistic approaches with the limit of the the the, the, real, the the fact that we rely on maps, right? And you know, is there a way to actually get rid of this the, this idea of having to use maps for for individual tasks? And this refers to, for example, learning semantics, inter interpreting the the world in a way like what do I see in the world and what do the individual th things actually mean? And this is why we also started looking into. The, the, the semantic interpretation of um, of the scenes, and here are a few examples about what we have been doing in the past. About, for example, um, semantic the combination of semantic segmentation and instance segmentation, which is called panoptic segmentation, where you not only get um, the classes, but also um, or the semantics, uh, but also the instances. Um, so, which means that the 
different objects or the different cars are colored differently on the right hand side compared to to the top uh, and in fact when you do this then you need a complex network architecture and without the time of having to of being able to go through this right now and i'd rather refer you uh, to the paper there's a complex network that we are using to basically perform this task and uh, when you do this and you get actually on, on, on semantic kitty and new scenes at the time where we published this work we were actually number one on the leaderboard but nowadays it's only worked a few days and then you are kicked out by a better approach um, which is an enormous challenge but it also indicates how important and interesting this field nowadays is and um, here you can see a few uh, examples of this approach for lidars for example the uh, panoptic segmentation, um, but it's not only uh, for, for LIDAR, but also for, for vision. And uh, the key question now is, is there a way to get uh, temporal consistency? And what you see here is when you do this over time, uh, despite that all the people have different colors, which is good, they also over consecutive frames have different colors, which is not so good because we actually want to be able to also track them, which uh, is something that uh, Bastian Leibe has worked uh, a lot on, right? The, the, the capability of identifying and tracking people. And um, so the combination of these two would then lead to the, the semantic segmentation on the left-hand side that is consistent over time. And this is something that is called uh, multi-object panoptic tracking, uh, where the instances are actually ideally associated correctly over time. And here there's a corresponding paper that we published um, one and a half year ago, if I remember right. Um, the, um, we are basically trying to combine these uh, two, these methods to actually get uh, like multi-object panoptic tracking. Again, a complex network architecture based on the, the one previously presented, but now also with uh, the, um, the, the corresponding heads for semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, and uh, multi-object tracking. And here you can see the, the, the evaluation data sets that we used uh, on, based on Kitty2 and uh, Semantic Kitty. And um, these are, again, results at the time where we published this. Um, the, um, we basically outperformed the, the state of the art methods. And here you can see this being applied on the, the data set. Uh, it's not perfect as you could see a second ago uh, or now right now with this compact uh, or this van here changing color. Um, so, but it is um, at least one step towards the, or another step towards becoming more robust in the interpretation of what other people do, which then would help you also to better understand the world. Uh, here you can so that see that this is not only on possible with vision, but also with LIDAR uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so two short things at the very end. So it's only like, uh, let's say three, four minutes that I need. So what we also looked into is um, by the, this problem of, of domain adaptation in the context of these vision-based segmentation and, and, and classification tasks. Um, so, and, and one of the key challenges um, in this context is going to nighttime. Right? So first of all, there's very, very few nighttime images uh, or nighttime data sets available and labeling nighttime data sets is enormously difficult. And here you can see on the left-hand side, a nighttime image with a corresponding semantically segmented image coming out of a conventional CNN approach. Right? You can see that this is uh, not very, not, not that what you actually, or it's not corresponding to the quality that you get for daytime images. So and here, this is a video. And uh, again, what you see is that the quality is not really sufficient here. And, and the idea that uh, my students had was that, like as to whether there's a way to actually utilize thermal cameras in this process to improve semantic segmentation um, because they look at least more robust with respect to the gap between day and nighttime changes, which led to this multimodal heat net um, idea, which basically is um, we basically use like an 
RGBD teacher to actually train our heat net to generate images that look similar to that what an RGBD teacher, what the RGBD teach, RGB teacher generates. And um, then we basically do this not only for daytime images, but also for, for nighttime images. And um, this is a vehicle that we use where you can see the thermal camera over here and the two RGB cameras um, that we, there's a data set as well that we recorded and uh, also with manually labeled images. I can tell you my students complain a lot about like having to label nighttime images because every pixel is black basically in nighttime. Um, so there was enormously um, uh, work intensive. And here you can see the experimental results. So what you see on the left-hand side is the RGB input image, the thermal image, that what the RGB teacher generates. And on the right-hand side, you see the ground truth. That what you see here is the output of the RGB thermal um, results where the, basically the network has at the very same time RGB and thermal. But the more interesting part are those frames over here where you basically see the results of the trained heat net where apply to RGB data only. Uh, so it, it, which immediately shows you that you can in, in the very end for practical applications, you can basically remove the expensive term camera in order to get better, achieve better results on the less expensive RGB uh, um, scenario. So this is basically the idea here. Here's a short video showing this in practice. Uh, starts with the time and then like ends with the nighttime images. Second, here we go um, with this. So the final thing that I want to talk is about like lane graph estimation. There's also something that we have been working on recently because the, the lane graph is enormously uh, important for, for, for navigation because it allows the vehicle to identify where the individual lanes are. And uh, that what we used in this context is um, the uh, this, this lane graph, net graph, RCNN, to basically from different bird's eye view representations from different modalities, modalities generate a directional lane graph that tells the vehicle where the individual lanes are. I do not want to go into the details of this and only show you a few qualitative results that we got. All right, so, so you can see from this that it's like, at least from my, from what I think is, it's pretty impressive that you can get like lane graphs of that quality out of it. Unfortunately, it is only good in more or less straight settings or standard roads. So as soon as it comes to intersections, it gets more and more complicated. But this is what, uh, I think from my perspective, the right direction, if you really want to go towards level five, then this from my perspective is the way to go. And um, so coming to the end, what I wanted to show you is that um, like some of the combination of right now, still the probabilistic approaches and machine learning are that what has been favored and uh, not to build a robust system these days, I would probably rely on the two of them. But I think in the long run, because maps are so expensive to build and maintain, and also approaches for like, dealing or adjusting maps are extremely uh, expensive and complicated. Right? So maybe we can just rely on machine learning in the very end. That is my, my question, potentially also my hope. I know that there's this data bottleneck, but with all the fleets that are around, we can maybe um, get around it. The key question is like, will we still need maps once we are able to infer them on the fly? Right? So this is the idea that I mentioned before that when you basically can build a map from one single image and you can do this accurately, then you don't need to build maps anymore because then the vehicle can actually make the decision while it is moving. Right? And then this, if this should actually be the case, then I know that most people like this slide, some people haven't seen it, then uh, all of a sudden, right, you don't need this book anymore. And uh, all you need is a cool deep network that, that does a task for you. And with it, I want to stop and uh, start the discussion. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Wolfram. This was very 
fascinating. We should all be clapping. I guess only a few of us <laughs> will be heard. 